Pat Riley spoke on Tuesday afternoon to wrap up what he considered a great season for the Heat. He spoke about Miami's disappointing loss in the Eastern Conference Finals. What comes next? And his views on Kyle Lowry, Bama to Bio, Tyler Hero, and more. And we'll break down what he said and try to read between the lines on today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat. Your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, Heat Nation. It's a Tuesday edition of Locked on Heat, your daily podcast covering all things Miami Heat. However, you may be listening or watching on YouTube, Odyssey, or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making us your first listen every day. I'm David Ramil, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Wes Goldberg. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks. Check out prizepicks.com, use the promo code NBA, or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. The dragon still hasn't left my body yet. Those were the words by Pat Riley regarding the loss to the Boston Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. Just one aspect of what he said to members of the media on Tuesday from FTX Arena. On today's show, we'll read into what he said about the past season, some individual players, and see if he left some clues regarding potential changes coming this offseason. He termed it an absolutely great season, but he was also somewhat disappointed in the outcome, as you would expect from Riley after 27 years as the general manager and president of this team. Uh, he had a lot to say, Wes. What were your general takeaways from that before we get into the minutia? Sure. Um, like you said, he was disappointed that they put together a roster that they thought could win the championship, right? And no matter what the conversation was from the national media perspective or whatever, this Heat organization believed that they should have beaten Boston and should be right now playing in the NBA Finals. Uh, but that when you don't do what you think you should do, that it does require a little bit about uh, of going back to the drawing board. And it feels like Pat Riley, everybody's going to make this black or white. Do the Heat need to add a star or not? My big takeaway was that Pat Riley believes that they need to add to this roster, right? Which is obvious because they didn't achieve their goal. But it's not that black and white. It's It also was going to require internal development. That that star might not be out there. And if that star is not a feasible player that they could acquire this summer, then it's going to be completely uh, internal development that gets them over the hump next season. And, and Pat Riley actually talked about it quite a bit. Uh, we put a mashup together of um, his most relevant answers here. Let's get to it. Head back. Uh, we would have a very good team. But you have to be, I think, very proactive in looking at how you're going you know, to improve. You're caught in betwixt and in between right now with, with these young players that are, that are rising. You know, I mean, think about you know, Tatum and, uh, and Brown, where they were three or four years ago in their playoff runs. You know? And so you know, once your, your younger players can elevate to a point that, that you know that you can win with them, and along with Jimmy and the other veteran guys, then, then you can always think about running it back and be successful. But is that going to be uh, what's going to lead to a championship? And that's, that's all you think about. I think we all uh, realize that you can always use more, especially when you've gone through a season and then you've gotten the result, then you begin to really analyze the result and, and why it wasn't as good as maybe you thought it, you know, you thought it, you know, should be. So I've been through this a number of times and I like the team that we have and uh, I like the core. And so let's see where we can go internally and, and let's see where we can go if something presents itself. There you have it, a mashup of different responses from Pat Riley regarding whether or not he wants to run back this roster for next season, whether or not the team needs an additional superstar. And when we were sitting in on that press conference, like the immediate takeaway as you're listening to Pat Riley, this is kind of the, the norm whenever you're listening to Pat for a prolonged period of time, always very optimistic, but there's always something to read in between the lines. He talks about this roster glowingly. Like he says it, we have the talent. Tyler Hero can be that superstar. He's not there yet. He's also just 22, et cetera. But you start to look into it a little bit more, and you start to realize that he's saying things, again, between the lines. We need somebody else. We might need somebody more. And at the same time, he's also apprehensive about saying 
well, we're going to go out and get a whale. He's made that right. mistake in the past. It was used against him to some degree. He finally got that whale in Jimmy Butler, and now he's looking to kind of build around that core as he sees fit. Uh, and, and so it's pretty apparent in listening to Riley that he does think changes are necessary if a change presents yeah. itself. And that's the thing to also consider is that he's he's going to admit that it's difficult to find a potential superstar or, or already a ready-made superstar to add to this roster. Yeah, and there was another point in the press conference where he basically said, we started this build, we need to finish the build. It's been like a right. three- or four-year project. We need to finish yep. that. And that really does lead you to believe that there's a piece missing that he needs to go find and add to what this roster is. Now, maybe that piece is already, it could be Tyler Hero, it could be Bam Adebayo, whatever. I don't think Pat Riley really believes that. I think that if Pat Riley, I, let me take that back and rephrase it. I think Pat Riley is really, really high on Tyler Hero. I think he's really, really high on Bam Adebayo. It's, those were his selections, those were his dudes, and I think he really likes what he's seen from them. But as he talked about in that clip, sometimes the windows just don't line up. Right, He talked about like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and what the Celtics have done. Well, they kind of had that young core and then brought in an Al Horford to to supplement them. Right, Then you bring in the veterans. So it's a little bit of a reverse thing with what the Celtics did versus what the Heat are doing. They're trying to get their young guys to catch up to the Jimmy Butlers and Kyle Lowry's and even PJ, like those guys, right? Like those are the veterans. And And when he talks about that core, you know that he's talking about basically Jimmy Butler, and I think Bam Adebayo. I think Bam, he's not off the table in a trade because I don't think anybody really is outside of probably Jimmy. But even if like the Bucks were like Giannis for Jimmy, like they would do that. But sure. um, oh, can I Bam, just add? I'm sorry. I saw people in our last episode together kind of leaning to me for for suggesting that Jimmy Butler was on the trade table or something like that. Like I I, I put it out there. And yeah, I, know. I put it out there in our conversation regarding Donovan Mitchell, who I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later on the show. And I just wanted to clarify, I don't think Miami's actually looking to explore a trade for Jimmy, nor would I explore a trade for Jimmy Butler. But having said that, uh, it's always, again, as you said, always a ta- uh, an option. In the NBA, we've seen superstars yeah. get traded before. Shaquille O'Neal got traded virtually in his prime after having just guided the Lakers alongside Kobe Bryant to four straight NBA trips to the finals. So, I mean... It happens. Anyway, it happens, and it happens for certain reasons, right? Like Shaq wanted, you know, there's the Shaq Kobe thing, but it's you know to the point. Like Bam, I think is as close to off the table as there exists. Mm-hmm. Also, so I think that's pretty much the core. I think it's Jimmy, and I think it's Bam, and, and I, I think you know there's other guys, but as far as untradeable guys, I would probably put those two up there. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you got to kind of you have to supplement what's around it. Tyler Hero could become that guy. They want to see him work this offseason, come back in training camp, and see what he's got. But also, if the right, if that ready-made superstar is out there and available, and and a trade is feasible, then obviously Pat Riley is going to explore that too. And that you kind of have to toe both lines if you're the Miami Heat and if you're Pat Riley. It's not as simple as all right, go trade for a star because there's so okay. many other variables, there's so many other factors. So if you're the organization, you have to be open to both ideas of running it back with basically this group with maybe some small tinkering along the edges of the roster, or kind of making that all-in move. Uh, Riley talked about, hey, I've been here before and we've made big deals, and that's exactly right. Uh, but you kind of have to wait for Shaq to, and Kobe to get into a fight and, and have one of them become available. You have to wait for a Jimmy Butler situation to become uh, uh, available, or, or Kyle Lowry even more recently, something like that. So uh, this offseason, I think that there's a lot of different options available to, or, or on the table for Miami. Um, it's just going to be exploring all of those avenues. Well, we'll talk about that in the next segment before getting into some of the other details regarding Bam and Bio, Tyler Hero, P.J. Tucker, and much more later on the show. But before we do that, just a reminder that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Daily fantasy made easy, and easy is really what they're all about. As fantasy props and pickups get more popular, Prize Picks is making it easy for you to play. They do that with the best NBA DFS prop game on the market. They offer more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator. Prize Picks offers any prop you can think of from points scored to rebounds, even steals. And check out the Prize Picks power play. Here's how it works. You predict the over under on a player's fantasy production, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. And it's just you versus the projected fantasy totals. For a limited time only, Prize Picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all of our users. You get $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point. But you have to use the code NBA. That's right. It's an exclusive offer just for locked on fans. Sign up today. 
Use the code NBA and get $50 for free if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point. And you can do it all using the award-winning app on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Prize picks is safe, and they offer fast withdrawal. So don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com. Use the promo code NBA or go to the App Store and download the app today. Prize picks, daily fantasy made easy. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Make sure to go check out the Locked On NBA Big Board. Host Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and the author of the NBA Big Board newsletter is joined by Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin, giving fans an in-depth look into the NBA Draft, Mock Draft, Player Rankings, and of course, Big Boards. It's free available wherever you get podcasts. We'll be doing our own draft analysis in the coming weeks, so make sure to stay tuned for that as Miami has things to consider regarding the 27th pick in the NBA draft, and we'll look into some of the players that might be available to Miami with that pick if they decide to keep that selection. But having said that, there are other options for Miami to rebuild or retool this roster because I don't think a full rebuild is necessary. They've got their core, as Pat Riley alluded to, but there are some names out there that we should explore. And one of them, I think, is the one that stands out the most. We talked about him in a recent show, and there's recent developments, all things concerning Donovan Mitchell and the Utah Jazz, as Quinn Snyder, as has been largely expected all season long, has chosen to step down as the coach of the Utah Jazz. That means there's a void there, and one that uh, Donovan Mitchell may or may not have some say in regarding his long-term tenure. But Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN also reporting that he's somewhat disgruntled and unsettled by the the ch- coaching change yeah. in Utah. So what do we make of the Utah Jazz news, Wes? And, and unnerved. It's such a specific unnerved. word. Unnerved. No, it was like he un- disgruntled. What was the other one you said? Uh, unsettled, I think. Unsettled and unnerved. Like so many things that he's on, on something. He's not happy, I guess. I, I suppose. Um, I mean, I don't know that that means much. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> That just basically means Donovan Mitchell's like, what's going on here? Why did my coach of eight years who has had just nothing but a winning record and success here just leave without another job lined up? I would right. be a little unsettled and unnerved if that were to happen to me t- to me too, if I was Donovan Mitchell. Like, what else is he, is he supposed to do? Not be unnerved by that? Right. Just be like, oh, yeah, like that's that's a normal thing that happens in the NBA. Um, look, from, from all the reporting around this and from what I understand, uh, the Jazz have gotten calls about Donovan Mitchell. Um, but it would su- and it would surprise me if the Heat were not one of those teams. Like I would, right. I, I'm sure the Heat did call about Donovan Mitchell, right? But uh, it's far more likely, I think, at this point, based on what's going on, that Mitchell stays in Utah and that the Jazz trade Rudy Gobert in an mm. attempt to sort of rebuild the roster around Donovan Mitchell as the primary star, the primary ball handler. Uh, I think they'd prefer to do that and, and at least try that for a season. Try that for a season. And just sort of see what happens rather than just completely blow up this whole thing, right? You still have a relatively new owner in Ryan Smith. Like, I don't think he wants to just take this roster and be like, yeah, let's just blow this thing up and right. start from scratch here. I think you want to obviously have a, a tentpole star, and that certainly is for them, Donovan Mitchell. That said, like, if, if Mitchell doesn't like where things are going, even during this offseason, there's nothing stopping him from pulling, like, a James Harden and and, and trying to force him way, his, his way out of there, but... Uh, If we believe all the smoke that Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert aren't like the best of friends and, and, you know, there might be some stuff going on between them, then trading Rudy Gobert, that's a really quick way to kind of get Donovan Mitchell's buy-in, right? Right. And so at least in the short term, if the most likely star to get dealt is Rudy Gobert, then that seems like a pretty easy way to get Donovan Mitchell to stay, at least in the short term. and. If that's what we're talking about, it doesn't really seem like Donovan Mitchell is going to end up in Miami or anywhere else that's not the Jazz um, anytime soon, at least not yeah. for now. So that's where I'm at with Donovan Mitchell. Obviously, all these things can change. The fact that this was leaked to ESPN, it was right. from Donovan Mitchell's camp. It had to be. Uh, yeah. it, it was. It was. That was sort of the smoke signal saying, hey, by the way, all this stuff we recognize is happening with Quinn Snyder, and that's his decision, and that's great. But I'm not happy if I'm Donovan Mitchell. I'm not happy with where the roster is. And something's got to give. I think that was just putting a little bit of easy pressure on the Jazz's front office, on Danny Ainge, of course, who's there now um, running things. But I don't think it necessarily means like, okay, get me out of here. I I think we're we're many, many, many steps from that. 
I, I think you're right on the money with that. Uh, from what I've heard, the Snyder decision was one that he was kind of mulling over all season long. Mm-hmm. So it seems like this isn't out of the blue. It wasn't yeah, like, oh, I looked at this all season. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It hasn't, it's not like he looked at the roster and the final outcome of the season and said, I can't take it anymore. I got to get out of here. It's not a sinking ship necessarily. That's not to say it was a perfectly harmonious season for anybody on that roster or for Quinn Snyder. But having said that, he, he wanted to you know make a clean break of it, see if there was other opportunities there. I'm sure he'll probably crop up soon and other coaching rumors and things of that sort. But Mark Stein believes that, that he's like just the heir apparent to Popovich in San Antonio. Like, and that's basically that's just what he's waiting fit. on. That's a fantastic um, fit. I could see that happening. That, that the other thing too with Donovan Mitchell is like all the all the reports that we've heard have been linked that have linked Donovan Mitchell to Miami have not been from Miami's front office. It's right. been rival front offices speculating that Miami is a likely Donovan Mitchell landing spot. And by the way, that makes sense. It makes sense in a lot of the same ways Absolutely. we always sort of pegged Victor Oladipo with right. the Heat as well. As they train here in the offseason, they have shown um, uh, uh, their fr- they 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 look up and idolize Dwayne Wade, both of them. And have relationships with Dwayne Wade, both of them, and and you know it's not it's not hard to connect those dots, and that's basically what all these other rival front offices are doing. So if you want to believe them and think that they have intel, good for you. Like that's up to, that maybe they do. That's your prerogative. I tend to side on this. Like yeah, I think the front offices around the league are speculating, just like everybody that has a Heat podcast and is on Twitter is doing too, right? Hey, and so that's, that's fine. I but I also think that there is something between Donovan Mitchell and the Heat. And I think that if Donovan Mitchell were to get traded, the Heat would be a likely landing spot. But like I yes. said, we're so many steps from like Donovan Mitchell's got four years left on his extension. We're yeah. so many steps away from Donovan Mitchell being available, from the Jazz putting him on the trade block, from Donovan Mitchell even demanding a trade. We're so right. many steps away from that. So it doesn't mean that the Heat won't one day have Donovan Mitchell on their roster. I right. just don't think it's happening. I, I from based on the intel that we have now, I would be surprised if it happened this offseason. That's not to say that things don't happen quickly and change quickly in the NBA because they do. We've but this is all the more reason why if the Heat really want Donovan Mitchell or the next star, more of a reason why you want to keep your powder dry so that you do have the resources available so that you haven't traded all your picks between now and 2029, you know, in the case that he does become available next summer or something like that. So that's something else to consider. Other thing I've heard about Mitchell and Utah is that he'd like to have a say in who the new head coach is. And while that doesn't prevent him necessarily from looking for an out once they make that final decision, you figure if he's going to have that kind of increased voice and he wants to establish himself as the name of the franchise, you know, he wants to be the face of the franchise. And if that's the case, he wants to pick who that head coach is. I don't see him requesting a trade anytime soon. I think he wants to build something in Utah. I don't think he wants to build it alongside Gobert, but I think he wants to stay. But to your point, if he is looking at uh, exploring other opportunities, New York is certainly an option, but I think Miami is certainly a strong candidate as well. But let's move on because the Mitchell talk is already getting exhausting (laughs) and we haven't haven't anything to actually report regarding Mitchell. But uh, having said that, there are other possibilities. And and look, to, to reiterate what we said, I think Riley believes firmly that this roster can improve that tyler bam etc can continue to get better and if that's the case they'll be more complimentary of what jimmy butler has proven capable of doing in the playoffs but if there's another potential star out there he's going to pull the trigger and i think you've got a couple of names for us i'm all over well it's it's things to explore like you said pat riley they're going to explore things they basically said that at the press conference today uh two names that we have to at least get out of the way bradley beal damian lillard we want to throw them in trade machine things all the time, fake trades. That's Keep doing it. That's fun. Whatever you want to do. Uh, no indication yet that Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard are going to be leaving. Damian Lillard is actually working with Portland's front office to figure out how they're going to move the seventh pick and some of these other resources they have to get him his second star. So I could see actually the Trailblazers with all of the resources that they have being more of a competitor to Miami in landing one of these other stars than actually Miami poaching them for their lone star in Damian Lillard. So that's if I'm if you're keeping an eye on Portland, that's how to keep an eye on them is as a potential competitor for one of these stars. Bradley Beal is one of those names that they've been linked to. Mark Stein, um, Kevin O'Connor, both linking Bradley Beal recently to the Trailblazers. Still, I'll believe the Bradley Beal stuff when I when I hear a demand. Right, all the indications so far is that he likes Washington D.C., wants to be part of the Wizards, wants to retire a Wizard for whatever reason. That's yeah. again up to him. Um, so we'll see, but right now Beal doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Um, Harrison Barnes is n- another name that I've seen out there. It's not exactly the star, right? Mm. Like that doesn't quite get there, but 
but it's definitely a way to potentially improve the roster. Um, it's not the cleanest of fits, but you know, he can create his own shot. He's six, eight, six, nine, uh, a lot of, you know, he, he's a little bit past his prime, but he can hit threes. He's a really willing and, and, and good, versatile defender. Um, you could see how it could work if you want to kind of play really, really big. You could play him at the four and have P.J. Tucker, if he opts in or comes back, come off the bench as sort of a sixth man in that front court. Now you've got three guys there that you can kind of rotate between. Um, but what are your thoughts on Barnes? Because I, I, like I don't him. know what the price would be, but yeah. Right. I, I think he's a nice player. I think he look. He's again a, a proven player, not old. He just he came into the league really young, and he's accomplished a lot of his career. He's a, an Olympian alongside Jimmy Butler, if I'm not mistaken. He's also uh, won a championship with the Golden State Warriors before, of course, they upgraded to Kevin Durant, and that's kind of what's held against him is that well, you're not Kevin Durant. It's like well, that's you know pretty much everybody else in the league. So at, at this point, like he is an accomplished scorer. Uh, he can do some things defensively. He can make plays for others. He's a smart passer, if not necessarily a willing one. And and yet, I don't know if that's such a huge upgrade that's going to immediately propel Miami into the finals. If you plug him in there for, I don't know what you would do. He, I would, he would obviously, well, likely be a starter or, as you said, a six-man. And if that's the no, case... No, I think he'd be that, a starter. Yeah, I think he'd yeah. be a starter. So if that's the case, is that much of an upgrade over what Max Struess? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure because you know you'd still defer to Jimmy and or Kyle a lot. He doesn't seem like your prototypical bucket getter. Yeah, bucket getter. So uh, that would be the know, thing. I, it's like where he's not exactly that guy that you're like. Yeah, he's the second scorer on this team for sure. Like maybe if Bam right. takes an improvement, maybe if Tyler is a starter. Like I could see a I could see a starting lineup of Lowry, Tyler Hero, or Max Struess, whoever wins that job, uh, Jimmy Butler, Harrison Barnes, Bam Adebayo, and you bring PJ Tucker off the bench, right? Like I, I could see that, uh, but that's now you're kind of like, like, like I I just don't know that Harrison Barnes is good enough to put himself over the top of those other guys outside of Jimmy Butler and be like, yeah, I am the bona fide second scorer. And now you're sort of left with a Tobias Harris situation where you're yeah. like, what exactly are you doing here? Uh, yeah. And if you're not scoring. You're not awesome at all these other things. Like you're not a great drive and kick playmaker. You're not. That's like not his game. Uh, you're a you're a, a, a good defender, but you're not locked down. You're not Bam at a bio all NBA. Um, so it, it's it's that that to me is a little. It's not quite at the level that we're talking about here in terms of adding another difference maker. High level. Is it an upgrade? Maker. Is it an upgrade? Yes. Is yeah. it the kind of upgrade that everybody's looking for and expects? And from what we've understood from Riley, they need? No, I don't think it is. No, no. And there's an opportunity cost, like I said, that comes along. Like now you start including draft picks. It's okay. Why? Like now yeah. you're taking, you're potentially wasting resources from something else down the road. Right. Uh, two more names I have for you. The one that All I right. keep coming back to is Zach Levine. I mm. keep coming back to this. He's a free agent. There's been some scuttle that he's not happy with his role in Chicago, that he doesn't want to play second fiddle to DeMar DeRozan. I don't know how much of that is he doesn't want to play second fiddle to DeMar DeRozan or that he doesn't want to play second fiddle, right? And because if he comes to Miami, he's obviously going to be the second guy next to Jimmy Butler. But there's obviously a little bit more of a baton passing potential there where it's like Butler, the baton goes to, to Zach Levine. I think that obviously the Heat are, are certainly more respected by players as an organization than is the Chicago Bulls right now. Um, and so I, I, I just wonder if Levine will fall for the the heat culture, Pat Riley, and just be totally into it and and want to and try to force his way here via sign and trade and force the Bulls front office to work with Miami's front office to make it happen. Um that to me is interesting. He's also signed with Clutch recently. So the obvious parallels to the Lakers are there. I wonder if that's an option. You know, playing second fiddle to LeBron certainly much different than playing second fiddle to DeMar DeRozan. Nothing gets DeRozan, but you know what I mean. Um yeah. So well, it's, that makes it, it but, but as far likely. as a fit, he's yeah. he's six six. He's definitely improved as a playmaker. He is a lights out three point shooter. Like he's like Clay Thompson level. Like look at his percentages. Like he's a lights out three point shooter. He's exactly what this Heat offense needs defensively. He's terrible and has been for a very long time. The like the stories of his improvement that there have been vastly overstated in Chicago. It's it was a little bit of a PR spin, um, but. If you're the Heat, do you bank on, the, hey, we can get more out of this guy, and even if we don't, we can surround him with four good defensive players, and he's the type of offensive player, obviously an all-star, who, you know what, who cares about the defensive concerns? He can elevate our offense, and if we're looking at the one team need that we have, the one thing that kept us out of the finals is that lack of a second shot creator, and Levine certainly answers that. So I keep kind of going back to him. 
it makes sense. And and I think, yeah, he's a, a potent scorer, potent offensive player, can do a lot, can attack the basket, obviously, can light it up from outside, can spot up off the mid-range too. So there's a lot of opportunities for him to be maybe even a primary scorer on occasion. He'll certainly course, take a, yeah. a lot of the offensive load off Jimmy's shoulders. Yeah. You could stagger him. Uh, yeah. Uh, but having said that, like I think the clutch thing makes it a little bit untenable for Miami to even negotiate a deal with him. Uh, I, he'd have to he'd have to go to his agents and say, Miami is the only place I want to be. And from that point, you kind of let Pat Riley in the front office work with Chicago and see if there's a deal to be made there. But I, I, I can't see one. I, I really can't. I don't, I don't know what it is that Miami could offer Chicago that yeah. they would say, you know what, this is going to help us get into the contention that, as we need. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, well, if Levine really- basically goes and says, Hey, I'm either going, I'm either signing with the Lakers or the Heat because he's a free agent. And so, um, and then basically just doesn't play ball. Like, we've seen stars force their ways into places. Like, as little as the Heat can offer, the Lakers can offer less. You know, yeah, like, are the Bulls right. going to be like, you know, yeah, we'll do that for Russell Westbrook straight up. Why not? Like, I don't see the Chicago Kalen Bulls. Kalen Horn Tucker, finally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We finally got our hands on him. Um, so I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's, just, it's like, hey, like, take a nice young player and Tyler Hero, and that's better than anything else you got. So, uh, in return for a guy who could potentially just walk away for nothing. I don't it's know. I, I don't know, but it's it's, it's, interesting. It, 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 it's hard to see the contours of a deal. It is. I'm with you. I just, I won't ever count the idea out based on recent history in the NBA and, and, and Pat Riley and the Miami Heat either. I've got one more name for you. It's a surprise name, but I think we should take our break first. Ah, uh, that's what's called a tease, ladies and gentlemen, and it works so well. Well, we'll get into that, plus some of the other quick hits from Pat Riley's press conference today. But before we do that, make sure to go check out Built Bars if you haven't already. Uh, look, I don't know what you're wasting time for. They are so delicious. They've got a new caramel brownie uh, flavor that's incredible. You're going to love it. Uh, you go to Built.com. Get, a, get yourself a mix box, and you get all these delicious flavors, so many different ones to choose from. You'll find one that you absolutely love and probably several others that you'll love as well because there's so many great ones to choose from, and they're adding new ones all the time. They're all great. They all give you the nutrients you're looking for without sacrificing any of the taste. You, you think you're getting some kind of indulgent dessert here because they just taste so good. Soft, easy to chew, 100% covered in chocolate. You don't even know you're eating a protein bar. That's how good they are. And yet you don't have any of the guilt associated with maybe eating something that you don't necessarily – that doesn't necessarily fit into your diet or into your long-term health plans. That's why Built Bars are so unique. And they have, again, so many delicious flavors. You can try their puffs, their uh, protein-infused marshmallow bars. Again, great selection. Great flavors to choose from. And best of all, if you go to built.com right now and use the promo code LOCK15, you get 15% off your next order. But only if you go to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15, then you'll get 15% off your next order of Built Bars. Just a reminder that you can always reach us via email at LockedOnHeat at gmail.com or via Twitter using the hashtag ask LOE. And of course, be sure to please subscribe to the show. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're all over the place. We're multidimensional and we want to continue to provide the great coverage that you came to expect over the NBA playoffs. We'll be covering the drafts. We'll be going through exit interviews from this past season. We'll be looking ahead to free agency, potential trades and all that. All the great conversations you want about the off season, we'll be including them on the show. So make sure to stay tuned for that. But you were just about to drop a name that I think it was. surprised a lot of people, myself included. I, I can't. Yeah, I haven't told you. This. No, you haven't. I, You're I'm not going to like caught. it. You're going to be upset. All right. Is it Russell Westbrook? It's not. You want to take one more oh, guess? No, no. Uh, I, You'll I get it. You'll get one more guess. You'll get it. No, I can't. I don't. I have no idea. I have really Kyrie no idea. Irving. Kyrie wow. Irving. Uh, if you and I agree that Vegas knows things, and I think we both agree <laughs> that Vegas knows things. Uh, they recently had the odds of Kyrie Irving's next team up. Uh, and this is according to Bet Online. Um, the great Jeff Shapiro, who sends us all these <laughs> emails with the, the latest odds on things. Or does he ever? And <laughs> daily. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, uh, Kyrie Irving, the heat, the, the, the odds on the heat were really high up there. It was basically like the Brooklyn Nets, the Lakers, and the heat. I think if I have that right, the heat were definitely one of the top three. Uh, and that made me do a double take. At first, I was a little dismissive, but I did do a double take. And then you start to put the things together here. 
And I just wonder, with as hungry as this Miami Heat team is for a championship, for as hungry as they are for high-level talent, because we all love the undrafted stories and the Struces and the Kayla Martin and stuff, but when it comes to elite skill level, I think you're, you're talking about, you know, Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero, I think has elite skill, though not elite athleticism. Jimmy Butler is up there. I don't know who else has elite skill level, elite athleticism on this team. Kyrie Irving does provide that. The laws in Florida are very different than the laws in New York. Um, and so if that were going to be an issue going forward, which hopefully would won't be because, you know, hopefully we think the pandemic is mostly over, that um, that could be something also. I don't know. I I don't love the idea of having to cover mm -hmm. Kyrie Irving, if I'm being completely oh, honest. But I do. <laughs> uh, if there was going to be a team that was going to be like, you know what? Screw it. Let's do it. Like, if, if, if this was an option to buy low on Kyrie Irving and it wouldn't cost much, let's call it like Kyle Lowry and Duncan Robinson goes Ooh. to Brooklyn. Now you're the, the Nets. You have a team first point guard in Kyle Lowry that can facilitate for Kevin Durant and Ben Simmons, uh, a good defender at the point of attack, which Kyrie Irving can't claim to be. Duncan Robinson is in another score. We don't really know what the future outlook is for Joe Harris from a health uh, standpoint. You put Duncan Robinson next to those guys, like nothing but wide open threes all day for him. It's not like that organization cares about defense all that much anyway, so Duncan Robinson would be a nice fit there. And then uh, if you're the Heat, you get a, a huge upgrade in Kyrie. If it doesn't work out, you could cut bait. You could give, you, maybe you're able to negotiate a shorter-term deal with him or something with like layered with a ton of incentives and things like that, games played and things like that. Um, and I, I just can't help but think, if you're Pat Riley and Eric Spolstra and that offer is across the table, Kyrie Irving, and you're able to get out from the Lowry contract, you're able to get out from the Duncan Robinson contract and buy low on him. Do you really think that they would say no to that? I'm not saying that they wouldn't, but I'm just like trying to put myself in their shoes. I kind of feel like they might say yes to that. I, I think one of the other things that stood out from the press conference is, and it's kind of like an underlying theme, and we've seen it many times before. It's an understanding inherently within the franchise that their window has a limited amount of time to remain open. Jimmy Butler's age, Jimmy Butler's contract, the future, who knows what it entails. And given that, you want a win-now team. Kyrie's a great fit for that reason alone. Like, he is an immediate contributor, wh whether he plays, when he plays, whatever. Like, he'll yeah, he play. Needs to play. He'll put yeah. up he'll, he'll put up 20 you know, plus points. He'll get you eight assists, some razzle-dazzle, some crazy moves, some crazy three-point shots. Like, that's just going to happen, and he'll get you there. Like I, I, even as you're talking about the potential trade parameters between this team and and Brooklyn, I think those two teams meet in the Eastern Conference Finals. Like a retooled Nets roster with Lowry and Duncan Robinson and the Heat behind Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and Kyrie Irving, those two teams are in a collision course for the Eastern Conference Finals with a, a toss up on who gets to advance to the NBA Finals. I, I don't have the same problems with Kyrie Irving that so many NBA fans in general and and people in and general media. seem to have. Yeah, uh, because he's difficult, because he's potentially abrasive, or because he, you know, he acts. Well, my only problem with Kyrie is is that he doesn't show up for half the games, and this it's just like it's it's one new reason after another, right? Like we everybody focuses on the the, the COVID not being vaccinated and stuff like that, but even before then, he would he just like took off, you know, he'll just take he off. He's certainly a free spirit. Time, so yeah, okay, that's one way to put it. Um, my only issue is like you know, do your job is, is kind of a, a very minimum thing. And I don't know that he always, like, he doesn't he show up for work a lot. And that's a problem. Right. And But if you're the Heat, this would be the ultimate test of Heat culture. This would be like, hey, you put him on a team with Jimmy and P.J. Tucker if he opts in. And this team, like, you try leaving that team, right? Okay. Like, and and I wonder if, I wonder if they would be able, I wonder if they would be so bold as to bet on their own culture. Yeah, that they, they could think that they could fix Kyrie Irving in a way that he, he, they could get him to buy in completely in a way okay. that he has not bought in since basically he left LeBron. I'll backpedal a little bit. Uh, they would probably talk to Jimmy, who played alongside Kyrie. Oh, yes, the of course. Team and the All-Star team. They would probably also talk to Goran Dragic, who was Kyrie's uh, teammate for a limited time this past season, and see what he has to offer regarding Irving's state of mind. And they'll put together a, a full you know, dossier internally on what they think Ooh. Irving might be able to provide. And having said that, like this is a franchise that 
gives players the leeway to do whatever the hell they want off the court so long as they're 100% committed to performing at a high level on the court. Like, I don't know. I, I The more I kind of talk about it, like Kyrie the player is never the problem. It's always Kyrie the person and his issues with – the NBA, society in general, whatever beliefs, right. whatever beliefs he thinks are being attacked or he wants to set up as, as, as something that's being attacked and he wants to be able to propagate. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very difficult to always get an accurate reading because you'll 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 see him kind of flip flop and and just be a very different version from one day to the next. Right. Uh, Nobody can figure this guy out. Yeah. No, I, I don't think he can figure himself out. And that's fine. That's that's part of the journey. Right. That's what humanity is all about. And I totally embrace that. And I support him and his journey. Uh, I just don't know if Miami is so willing to embrace that journey on their roster. Like, I mean, from what we've heard, like Josh McRoberts was a problem because he had long hair and he wasn't committed 100% to basketball all the time. Like, I mean, that's that's the not going to cut it. Like, right. And, and like, to your, it, it's kind of interesting, right? Like, if you're all in on this championship window, then there is, like, you, you can really easily talk yourself into buying low on Kyrie Irving and being like, hey, let's just do this and, and see what happens. But at the same time, like, the championship window is closing. Can you afford like the Kyrie Irving experiment? Isn't hey, let's see what let's see how it goes for a couple of weeks. You know, that's that's not how like it's going to be a whole season dedicated to the Kyrie Irving experiment. And can you afford to experiment for a year and have it potentially be a disaster and and not really know where you stand with him and and and, and maybe exhaust him as an asset even and to the point where you can't really move him because if it doesn't work in Miami, where's it going to work? You know, and so I. I, it, it, it would him. take a lot somebody of homework. Take. Somebody will take them, but it, you might not even get back what you got, what you gave up for them. And well, now, you, and then what happens up, to your championship? If you're giving window. up Lowry and Duncan, you're not necessarily giving up all that much. Again, I, I hate to use this kind of terminology, but I don't think you're sacrificing. I mean, you're you're sacrificing an older Lowry who was only here under contract for another couple right. of seasons. You gave up on a couple of them. You know, that's not big a deal. I think you can find somebody else who provides the, the shooting eventually that Duncan Robinson yeah, yeah. can. You, you already got that in Max Struess. Um, and, no, you're not giving up a lot. In, you're not giving a lot up in the assets, but you're you're giving up a lot in in time. You're giving up a year. You're giving up That's a year right. of the window. If if it if if it doesn't work out, you think it'll work? A year in the you think it'll work out? I have like no Kyrie idea. I don't know if Kyrie will show up. I don't know. I have no idea. Like you said, I don't have the dossier. Like he'd have to put together the dossier on Kyrie Irving. It, it's it's a I'd good love to point. Read that. Um, that <laughs> I don't even know if it would be written in English, David. I have no idea what the wow. Kyrie Irving does. It would be written in like it's Sanskrit. Encrypted language. Wow. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so that's that. But th those were all my names. Those were all my names. Do you want to do a quick notebook dump on the uh, rest of the uh, the Pat Riley presser? Yeah. Well, let's go through. Let's okay. we'll start off with Tyler here. He was asked about Tyler's sensational season. Uh, Pat, very complimentary what Tyler could do. As we said before, he's 22. He's young. He's got potential. And yet, recognizes there's a need for improvement. He also said that uh, he thinks he could – Put on another 10 pounds of muscle, baby, another 10 yeah. pounds uh, so he can continue to be there and, and be consistent in his growth and development that he's here. That he's had a great season. He's just not here yet. Right. But that's uh, And then asked if he's going to be a starter. He said he has to, you Ooh. know, Tyler Hero said, I think I've earned being a starter. Pat Riley basically saying, you got to come into training camp and earn it. Right. You got to earn it there, uh, which there. which is notable. Uh, Bam Adebayo, he was asked mm. about him. Um, basically said it might be time to reevaluate how Bam is used in the offense and looking to get him 15 quality shots a game. So Bam Adebayo averaged 13 on almost 56% shooting last year. So it's not far off from that, but you consider all of the responsibilities he has as a playmaker, uh, as, a, as a pick and roll screener and roller to the basket. Pat Riley going so far as to say, you know, it can't, maybe it can't all just be rolling to the rim and finishing plays. Maybe it's getting him involved with other types of actions to get those high quality looks, 15 high quality shots. That's basically what the other type of second scores, like uh, Chris Middleton averages 15 shots, Tobias Harris, Miles Bridges, like guys who are considered second scores. That's that tends to be like that, that area is about 15 shots a game. So I, I don't think that that 15 number was a coincidence. I don't think that was an accident from Pat Riley. I think 15 makes a lot of sense. Um, go ahead. Also talked about Duncan Robinson. Yep. Uh, you called him a specialist. You can't win without him. I pointed out that in his first playoff game this past season, he scored 27 points. So he obviously is a big fan of what Duncan can do. And yet he also recognized, look, Duncan hit a, a you know, he hit a corner. He wasn't able to continue to progress, maybe even taken some steps back, has to continue to diversify his impact on offense. And so I, I think, I think look, Pat Riley again. One of the the, the the running streams or underneath underlying lines or themes of this whole presser was 
Like he's a believer in the stories behind all these guys. He loves this gritty, undrafted team and everything else. And Duncan is a big part of that. He loves Duncan's journey. He wouldn't have given him the contract otherwise. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of you are already kind of sold on the idea of trading Duncan or, you know, Duncan sucks. And this, I mean, he's getting a lot of heat, no pun intended, unnecessarily. So uh, Pat Riley is a believer in what Duncan can do. Does that mean that he's not willing to trade him? Absolutely not. I think he might have been a little talking him up too, a little bit as an asset. That might have been a factor there, but I, Maybe I don't know. Pat that's, not, that's not how I read it. And I, okay. I tend to be more cynical than you do about this. That's true. But anyway, uh, uh, Victor Oladipo. Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry yeah. needs to be in world class shape. Um, mm. Which I and you know, Pat. There's been a lot going on with Kyle Lowry. We know he missed a lot of games for personal reasons. He dealt with the hamstring injury in the playoffs. Like there's a lot of stuff injuries during the regular season too. Uh, all of that is an excuse, but it is a, a reason also. And Pat Riley doesn't really offer excuses in press conferences. That's not really his thing. But he went. He did mention those things in regards to Kyle Lowry. So I do think that there was an understanding of what Kyle Lowry was going through this season. Uh, but also, the message was very clear, and they basically yeah. already told Kyle Lowry, "Hey, you need to come back in better shape." You know, extending waiting circumstances what they were in the past, but going forward, when training camp rolls around in October, you need to be in world class shape. Uh, and and I expect Kyle Lowry to come back in world class shape. But that was yeah, those were the words Kyle. he used. Yeah. He talked to Kyle. They'll figure it out. They'll see what they can do to yeah. get him there. Uh, but, yeah, the expectation is certainly there. And it's been put out in the public. So we'll see how Kyle responds. I'm sure it'll be favorably. P.J. Tucker um, mm-hmm. obviously has the player option um, or can become a free agent. Called him a cornerstone of the team and likened him to Udonis Haslam. I don't know yeah. that there exists higher praise for a Miami Heat player mm. than being compared to Udonis Haslam. Obviously, this team wants P.J. Tucker back. They have sent that message to P.J. Tucker that they want him back. The best-case scenario for them is for, obviously, him to opt in. I wonder if he'll explore the market. There's a way to kind of have your agent talk to people. Do you think that I can get more than what the player option is? Can I use that as leverage to get a little bit more money from Miami? All of that will be on the table. We'll see how it plays out, but the Heat obviously want P.J. back. Yeah, I don't feel like this is the same situation as like what Jay Crowder had a couple of years ago. Like Jay, you know, was still a little bit younger, wanted a little bit more flexibility. Like that's a player that I pointed out at the time. Like he had been traded five times under the same contract from you know, Dallas to Boston to yeah, yeah. Cleveland to Utah and then to Miami, Memphis and then Miami. So a sixth time when you really think about it, that all under one contract. Uh, not kind, not not you know, not very fair for as a player and looking obviously for stability. PJ, he's already got his ring. He's gotten paid money. I think he's looking for a place where he feels comfortable, and I think Miami certainly fits the bill. And it's nice to hear that Pat Riley is such a believer in what PJ can bring to the table. We certainly know that Spo feels the same way. He's talked about him glowingly over the course of the playoffs and, mm-hmm. and even during the regular season about yeah. when PJ brings the table. So, and he likes. I think that he likes the fact that he has a little bit more of an expanded role versus the one he had mm-hmm. in Milwaukee or even in, mm-hmm. in Houston to a certain degree. The other yeah. side of that is Victor Oladipo, much more up in the air, and that was. It doesn't mean that the Heat don't want him back, but I think that there's going to be a price that they're willing to pay for Victor Oladipo and a price that they're not willing to go above for Victor Oladipo. Yep. Uh, they value his skill set that he's able to break defenses down off the dribble like we saw in the postseason. Uh, but I do think that there's other, you know, obvious trepidation with his game. He's a little unwieldy on offense sometimes. Defensively, I think the hustle is, is a little showy. I don't think he's as good defensively as people – or he wasn't as good defensively this past year as people want to think he was – with all the steals and the hustle stats and stuff, he needs to improve on that end and continue to bounce back from the injuries that he ha- he was dealing with. But um, basically, Riley said, well, we're going to be talking to his agent, which is all you need to know. It's like, hey, we'll talk about price. We'll see where it goes. I have a theory on this, David. I Ooh. think that they should just give him... They have his bird rights. I yeah. think they should give him a nice-sized deal. I think they should explore giving him $10 million a year if they're willing to start getting into the luxury tax and things like that. So if they have the buy-in from the Arison family that they can exceed the luxury tax. This is a rare opportunity that you have to get a player who is highly regarded in the NBA, who is a tradable player, an asset, and you could get him at like 10 million as opposed to maybe like seven or 8 million or something like that. If you can get him at a a nice sized number, that becomes more of a trade chip, right? Because the Heat, they don't have a lot of those tradable salaries, right? It's the big 30 million numbers, and then it's like the Max Struess veteran minimum type guys at 2 million. If you can... If you can maneuver and find yourself, like the Contavious Caldwell Pope thing, right? What the Lakers did forever with him. You can kind of put him at $10, $15 million a year. Yeah. Suddenly that's something that you can build a trade package and, around and, and potentially and get a good player for, maybe at the deadline Pat, or something like that. 
Pat did this a couple of years ago, signing Kelly Olenek, Deion Waiters, James Johnson, like all yes. these four year, 60 type million dollar deals with a lot of incentives laid in there. For Ola yeah. Depot, based on his health, play a minimum of 70 games and you get an extra yeah. $2 million that don't Something count like against that. the cap. Yes. I, you could absolutely see that working out. It's just, I don't have, I don't know. We'll talk about Victor Ola Depot later on this season when we talk about, or the off season when we talk about free agency and things of that sort. I just don't have an accurate gauge of the market yet. And it's hard to predict. Like I think he showed out in the playoffs. He showed that he's still capable of some things. I think if yeah. you look closely enough uh, past the smoke and mirrors, there's still glaring holes there. He's not at hundred percent physically. Does the potential still exist for him to return close to that point? I think it does. I think a full off season of work with Miami will certainly help him out. I just don't know what other teams are willing to pay. If, if the Knicks so my strike sense, out, my sense on that, my but just yeah. my sense on that is the taxpayer mid level or the mid level, depending on the team, uh, if you're a taxpaying team or not, is, is and that's basically between six and a half and and ten and a half ish million. That's from my sense what think that's a four million dollar difference, but I, I think that's where most teams will come in and talk to Victor Oladipo's agent with is is something around whatever mid level exception they have available. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, and, well, that does it for today's episode i think i don't think there was anything uh, else that really stood out no uh, i mean he was like, he was uh omar yurtsevin he said you know nice young oh, yeah. player maybe not ready for a starting job much to the chagrin of many heat Sorry, fans that want to see yurtsevin next to bam out of bio and then he also said he could do more push-ups than ira winderman which i thought was very notable um he could probably also do more push-ups than, than me um can he do more push-ups than you i don't know i've never seen riley doing push-ups uh not looking forward to it i'm gonna go out on a limb and say no but oh uh, wow I'll, I'll, yeah i'll, I'll I'll take you know that what? Pepsi challenge, Pat. No, we'll do it. Bring we'll it all, it. baby. Schenectady here. Come on, I'm not. I'm not scared of you, 77 years old. Maybe I was being maybe modest. I mean, I like I. I was being. He, I could definitely do more push-ups than Pat Riley too. I saw Top Gun right. the other day, and they had to do like 200 well, push-ups at one up. point. And uh, um, I, I'm probably. I could probably do that. You know, 200 push-ups is like a piece of cake. That's easy. In a row. Yeah. Why not? You could- Wow, that movie really got you fired up, then, huh? I don't, I don't, I don't think that's Where necessarily what that was implying. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll break down some more Pat's press conference and our upcoming uh, exit interview shows because I think that's you know kind of where you start to gleam certain things that the organization may or may not believe about a player and how they project moving forward. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in upcoming shows, but that'll wrap it up for today as far as our analysis of Pat Riley's press conference. Again, optimism looking ahead and yet also the need to explore other opportunities to improve this roster. Cause I think that's uh, that's the key, especially when you want to continue in your efforts to bring a champion. Oh, that's one more thing that I took away. Like he, he you know, he, he, he said that Kyle Lowry in his statement that it was a wasted year cause they didn't win the championship. Like he kind of, he kind of uh, poo pooed that. I think that was the terminology he actually used, but at the same time, like he kept speaking about wanting to win a championship. That's what you're here for. That's what the goal is every year. So I, I, a little bit of a conflicting message there. Well, he doesn't necessarily think it was well, a waste. Yeah, of it wasn't a waste, right? You built things, you found things out in your pursuit of a championship, right? You know more about your roster now than you did at the beginning of the season. So I think it's fair to say it wasn't a waste, but you obviously didn't accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. Yeah. All right. That's fair. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks so much for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Make your second listen Locked On NBA from the first jump ball to play in tournament to the last possession of the finals. Locked On Experts. Take you deep inside the playoffs with insight and analysis affecting all 30 teams. This is David Romero signing off for now. Thanks so much for joining me, Wes. Wrap it up, B. Like and subscribe on YouTube.